Knox Presbyterian Church, good morning. It's good to be together today. For those of you who are here in person, I uh, feel like if we were in a boat, we would uh, be capsizing pretty quickly here. We are a little bit misbalanced. That doesn't bother me, as long as it doesn't bother you. I don't think it bothers me. I drew attention to it immediately. <laughs> those of you who are joining us virtually, glad that you're here, and maybe you're a little bit more balanced than we are. Um, if this is your first time here, or if it's been a minute, this is a community that's attempting to express faith in God through self-giving love. We believe that that's the kind of God uh, and the kind of love that we have from our Creator, from Jesus, and our response, therefore, is to be doing the same for those around us. Because God gives love freely to all of us, uh, that is the essential makeup of who you are as a human being. That imbues you with a nature, with a, an identity uh, that is far greater than anything else we could ever come up with. You are loved. That is who you are. Please do not forget that because the world's going to try to tell you something different a lot of the time. Uh, worship today is going to look uh, pretty... Well, as normal as worship can be, <laughs> I suppose. Um, we're continuing on in the story that we left off in last week when we had Lace preach so well for us on what it means for God to be our daily bread, the bread of life, and the kind of nourishment that we receive from that. Uh, so as we sing, as we pray, as we meditate on God's words, uh, let us today, all of us, um, enter into a, a heart set, a mindset that allows us to be open to the goodness and the beauty and the newness that we are experiencing this morning in this creation that God has made. Let's worship God. Good morning. Friends, for our Centering for Worship this morning, um, we can sing the song together, Take It Easy. Again, just a reminder that whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are, however you find yourself this morning, you are beloved, you are enough. You are God's beloved child, and nothing can change that. So you're welcome to sing with me as we sing this or to allow the words to be an invitation to you to receive that good news. Uh, but I invite you to remain seated for this first song and then to stand during the second. But with that, let us center for worship by singing Take It Easy.
rest in the shade of his Please be seated. What she said. I got coffee with someone this last week. Is this a little loud? Am I in two mics right now? Is it okay? Okay. I got coffee with someone this last week who doesn't go here, um, who has an interesting journey, story with God, faith, church, and Uh, has done a lot of thinking, a lot of learning, a lot of growing, and at one point said to me, um, I don't need to confess to you. He knew I was a pastor. I don't need to confess to you or confess to God or anybody else the things that I've done wrong. God knows that I've done those things. I know that I've done those things. Let's just move past them. And um, so I, 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 I nailed him right there in the, in the moment. I said, like, you're wrong. This is... This is I was supposed to go, I didn't do that. Um, but I've been thinking about that, uh, and I don't know this person very well at all, uh, but this person had a, a lot of pain in their life, like a lot. And I can only imagine just how strong the temptation is to want to move through anything painful at all when you just feel saturated with it, when it's just encompassing everything. It can feel painful to confess the things that we have done or left undone that have caused us to sin and fall short of God's glory. And I will tell you that uh, as hard as that is, the, the promise of forgiveness and redemption through that is so much bigger and so much greater. It it compels us and I think gives us the freedom to be able to name these really hard things because we know that we're not just naming them for the sake of asceticism or self-flagellation. We're naming them because we know that there is hope for forgiveness. So with that, I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession this morning. Let's pray. 
Gracious God, you and you alone know the extent to which each and every one of us have sinned against ourselves, one another, and against you. There are lots of things that we can do that would cause us to choose ourselves, self-interest, comfort, security, over you. Lots of things that would cause us to say no to our neighbors, say no to you. You know what we have done. You know what we have left undone. And in some of those cases, we've tried to block them out because of shame and guilt. Here, Lord, in this time of silence, we not only ask that you would hear our prayers, confessing our sins to you, but that you would help us to be bold and brave and remember and name the ways that we need to uh, confess and work that out within the context of your forgiving mercy. Hear our prayers in this time of silence. If the Father is quick to love, quick to love, why aren't we? If the Father is quick to love, quick to love, why aren't we? We who have had much forgiven should give as we receive but we withhold amazing grace and shame a wretch like me if the father's quick to love then why aren't we If the Spirit comes in peace, comes in peace, why don't we? If the Spirit comes in peace, comes in peace, why don't we? Lay down his power, lay down. 
spirit comes in peace, and why don't we? If the Father's quick to love, then why aren't we? Scripture is unclear about a lot of things. One thing it is quite clear on is that through the saving death and resurrection of Jesus, my friends, your sins, all the ones that have happened in the past, all the ones that happened earlier today, all the ones that will happen for the rest of your life, those are forgiven. Be at peace and free from the weight of guilt and shame. Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Scott. Thanks, Drew. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to help me out with this prayer. Um, I'm going to frame it in two ways really quick. I'm going to ask you to think of different categories. I'm going to go really big and then narrow really far down. And I encourage you to think broadly about God's creation. If you're thinking about an individual, that's great. Remember that God knows everyone, right? You may be thinking about an abstract person, but that's a real person in God's uh, vision and care. Um, I also encourage you to think either uh, kind of like a, a quick checklist, a breadth first, or think really deeply about a single thing, depth first, that's computer science stuff. Um, but right, think broadly about God's creation as, as we go through this. Um, not just people, not just places, not just things, hopes, dreams, things like that. So. First thing I want you to uh, think about is on a global scale. Think about something that you wish to celebrate. Think of something that you want to give thanks for. Think of something that you're excited about. And in the same context of a global scale, think of places in need, people who need protection, people who need peace. Creator, Lord of all existence, we lift up these prayers for thanks, for your guiding spirit, for shield against oppression, for unity. Bring our context a little bit closer. Think regionally. I don't really like the idea of borders anyway, so think how, however wide do you want this region to be. And first think again in celebration, in gratitude and thanks, in support. Then I want you to pray for those who are sick, for places that are spoiled in beauty, for communities in need. Loving God of our earth, we lift these people in places to be wrapped in your embrace, to know your love, and to feel your warmth. 
I want to think locally in our cities and our communities. Again, start with communities that you're grateful for, things that you're thankful for, places that you love. Offer a prayer for those who are sick, hungry, devastated. Protector God, we lift up these hopes of tomorrow. Let us work alongside you in this work of kingdom building, for we need your support. I want you to get really personal. Think of people directly in your life, in this room, in this community. First start with joy and love, the good kind of pride that brings us joy. Then think of people in this community who need healing, who need guidance, who need God's loving hand. Knowing God who is already with us Take these heart meditations and shine in righteousness. We give thanks and recognition of your beauty and love in unity. Amen. So often in scripture, and particularly in our texts uh, from today, we see that the spiritual cannot be separated from the physical or the tangible. And the good news in that is that as God cares for us with God's own personal presence through the spirit, so God also cares for us in our very physical everyday needs. So with that, um, at Knox, we practice this spiritual practice of offering which is itself a practice of seeing the ways that both the spiritual and tangible are intertwined. We first sing the doxology, acknowledging that all we are, all we have, spiritually, tangibly, in all ways, is a gift from God, and as such, we can return to God that which has been given with the promise that it will be used to bless others, spiritually and tangibly. So, with that, I invite you to stand as we sing the doxology, and then you are invited to come forward and participate in offering by giving of yourself through lighting a candle, uh, lighting a candle to represent your prayers for others, or giving of your tithes and offerings in the tray. Let us stand.
The first reading today comes from 1 Kings 19, 4 through 8. But Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly... An angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength that the food or excuse me, in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. I love a nap and a snack. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. Taylor alluded to this already, but God is really concerned about meeting your tangible needs. And uh, if that's all God was concerned with, then uh, I'm not sure that Elijah continues on with his trip to Horeb. And I'm not sure that a lot of things happen. And... Uh, well, you don't need me to say that. That's actually what Jesus is about to say to us in our second scripture reading. So this picks up where we left off last week. We're going to read John chapter 6. We're just going to, we're just going to uh, touch base in verse 35 just to remind us of the context that we're in. And then we'll continue on uh, verses 41 through 51. It goes like this. 
Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Well, then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Now, O Lord, prepare our hearts to receive your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that in hearing we may obey your will. We acknowledge, gracious God, that this is but one interpretive lens through which your word is proclaimed. In that acknowledgement, help us to be gracious and understanding with people who see things differently. In your name we pray, amen. Okay. Last week, Lace really did a tremendous job in describing how in uh, this story, Jesus is reorienting people's uh, perspectives away from their stomachs and towards their hearts. We're moving away from things that are temporal and toward that which is eternal. Uh, it's an understandable shift that needs to be made for the people because Jesus has just performed a miracle that fed them. They were hungry, they needed lunch. Jesus gave them lunch. He multiplied a couple fish and some pieces of bread so that 5,000 people could eat their fill. That was significant. Uh, and even after their stomachs are full, the people are still in this kind of temporal mindset. They're chasing after Jesus because they want someone to be able to continue to do that again and again and again for them which again makes sense. In the first century, food insecurity was significant. Nutrition was a major, major problem. So if there's someone who can, like God did for our ancestors way back when in the wilderness, just supply our daily bread for us so we don't have to go make it ourselves or if we don't even have any money, we can't get it at all, that's a huge box checked off of my daily list. That's incredible. Based on that story and based on so many others, we see evidence that yes, God, Jesus, cares about you, your stomach, your well-being, uh, the way that you get to live equitably in this world. God cares about these things in your life. And, as I already spoke to earlier, if that was the only thing that God cared about, God probably wouldn't be worried about forgiving sins. Jesus probably wouldn't have died on the cross. There are bigger things at play here that require a shift 
shifts in our posture, in our mindset, one that goes away from our stomachs and towards our hearts, shifting away from that which is immediate and temporary that we are so likely to react to and towards something that's more eternal, something more permanent, long-lasting. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's giving some illusion to the fact that uh, the Israelites in the desert uh, received this daily bread, this manna, the stuff that came down from heaven and was there for them every day. And they would eat it, and then it would be gone, and then they would get it the next day. And uh, what Jesus is now saying is, because I am from heaven, I am this metaphorical bread, that if you eat me, we'll talk about that in a minute, if you're with me, you will never be hungry again. You'll never be thirsty again. You will be satisfied eternally and have a life that actually never goes away. And the people are complaining about that. They're grumbling. They're asking all these kinds of questions. I think that Lace made a really good point last week in noting that there might be some deeper heart cries going on here. There might be some deeper yearnings that oftentimes get expressed through unanswerable questions. How do we do this God, what does all this mean? How do we follow through on what you're offering us? How long, O Lord? When is this going to end? Why, why, why? They're asking this question of Jesus. How is it possible that you could be this eternal bread? We know your parents. Like, you were born. You didn't come from heaven. This doesn't make any sense. It would be like if I went over to Zips and I bought a cheeseburger and I gave it to you and I said, hey, you can take as many bites of this cheeseburger as you want. And guess what? There's still going to be cheeseburger no matter what. Like, that wouldn't make any sense. Like, y'all have been to Zips before. Like, you know how this works. It's hard to make a shift, especially considering that Jesus is using a familiar story which already has some formed cognitive categories for the people, like they're thinking about how this works through a particular framework, it's hard to make a shift from that into something new. And this is not just something new. This is something unprecedented. This is brand new. The idea that we could have something that never goes away. The problem, I think, with regarding Jesus through that earlier, unformed, immature framework, the temporal framework, is that not only do we tend to misunderstand what Jesus is saying, which is very clear from this story, they don't understand what he's saying, not only do we tend to misunderstand, we tend to misappropriate Jesus' identity and power in our lives. Instead of Jesus being at the center, instead of God's love being at the center of who we are and all we do, God becomes kind of like a, like a bonus modifier, like an add-on, someone or something that augments our lives just as they are and helps us achieve our goals and our dreams. Does that make sense? Does it make sense because that's what we do? Did we do this? I think it's what this crowd is doing. We just want to keep on living our lives. You just made it so that we don't have to worry about food forever. That's great. If you wouldn't mind just staying in that lane for us, that would be great too. But Jesus is about something more, and they can't quite see it yet. I was was sad to realize that today's the last day of the Olympics. I'm a big Olympics guy. I watched a lot of them this year. The last event, I think it was the last event, was this morning. It was the women's basketball gold medal game. Did you watch it? It was a great game. If I, feel, if I seem underprepared for today, it's because I was watching basketball this morning. It was a great game. USA, does anyone really care about this who doesn't know? Should I not tell you? You know what happened? You you really care about it. That's why you're raising your hands. It was a great game. USA won by one point. I mean, it's kind of three points, but technically one point against France, the host country. 
And uh, it was this big deal, and afterwards, the post-game interview, Asia Wilson gives this interview and is saying, like, God was with us. God did this. God was doing something. God's the reason that we won this game. And, okay, so just, uh, like, at face value, I like that. I like that people can be bold about faith. I like that people can give credit where they believe credit is due. I like that people can be grateful, give gratitudes for God's goodness. So nothing intrinsically wrong with that. And I don't know Asia Wilson. My concern is that if that is the, if that is the only way that we are oriented towards God, like if it stops there, if our only orientation is we give thanks when we win and we get mad at God when we lose, that sounds like a temporal framework to me. That sounds like wanting God to be the bonus modifier on your MMORPG character. That's, that sounds like wanting God to be an add-on, to just continue to boost the life that you're living right now. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell this crowd. Like, it's not just about me giving you food. It's different now. My father gave food to your ancestors in the desert, but you know what happened to them? They died. Not because of the manna, I don't think. They eventually died. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am a few times, and elsewhere besides saying, I am the bread of life, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who believes in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives believing in me will never ultimately die. That is good news. That is good news for all of us. And to say that I am the bread of life is a metaphor to say that in the same way that eating a cheeseburger fills up your stomach, when you are with me, rather when I am in you, there is a fulfillment, like nothing you will ever be able to get in any other kind of capacity. You may have this deep longing within your heart, within your soul, for something that just is going to take the pain away, this deep longing for something that's going to feel meaningful, for something that's going to feel real. And if you are trying to find that with a bigger car or with a bigger house or by looking better or by being more fit, you are going to end up at the end of this life dead and unfulfilled. What Jesus is offering by saying, I am the bread of life, is a fulfillment that happens right now and a fulfillment that is eternal. There is something about uh, being in Jesus and Jesus being in us that provides satisfaction to those heart cries, those deep yearnings, those hard questions. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. This is the weirdest thing about Christianity. Well, the weirdest thing about Christianity at one point was that everyone thought we were cannibals because of stuff like this. That's not real. That's if you read the Bible literally, which sometimes you can. A lot of the times you got to use your imagination we're not cannibals, but we do believe in the life everlasting, and we believe that part of that life begins right here, right now. We believe that the fulfillment that we have by being people who are believing, trusting in God is for us right now. So what does it mean, if we're not literally eating Jesus, what does it mean to eat Jesus? If he's saying, I am the bread of life, if anyone who eats of this bread will have eternal life, Let me go back to cheeseburgers. When I eat that cheeseburger, I believe to a degree that it is going to satisfy my hunger. When I take a sip of this water, I believe that it is going to, at least for a temporary amount of time, remove the dryness in my parched mouth. 
It's weird to say it this way, but it's almost like saying, I trust that it's going to satisfy me. Is that fair to say? Trust is the equivalency in this metaphor to eating. So how do we trust and therefore receive this uh, satisfaction that we are all deeply craving? It's much more expansive than this, but I think that a good place to start would be to say, I trust that I am loved. You can trust that you are loved because God loves you. Then there's a whole lot in this world that ends up mattering a lot less than that. There are a whole lot of questions that you may not end up finding to be all that compelling anymore because all of a sudden they don't matter as much as this absolute truth. You are loved because God loves you and God loves you enough to die for you so that you will never ultimately have to die. You can trust that you are enough. You are enough because God gives you enough. You can trust that no matter what is going on, no matter how deep or dark the pain that you are experiencing may feel, no matter how sad you may be right now, no matter how angry or frustrated that all this might be, whatever that is that's going on in your life, you can trust you're not alone in this. You can trust that there is a God who weeps with you in this. And you can trust that this too shall pass. That's the only temporal framework that we need to be thinking about. You can trust that God is with you, that God is for you, that God does in fact care about meeting the tangible needs of the people in our community, meeting your needs. And as we respond, we should be doing that as well. And we cannot allow ourselves to simply stop there. I'm not advocating that we set up a faith-based social services enterprise and we make people wait for lunch while we give them a sermon. I think that's a bad idea. I'm saying that it's got to be both. I'm saying that God cares about both. And I'm saying that for as long as we are only thinking about the temporal, about our stomachs, we will never quite get what God is really going after in our lives, our eternal lives. Now, that trust piece is the last thing I'm going to say. The trust piece is hard. Trust is hard. Trust takes trust. Uh, it takes energy. It takes uh, faith. And sometimes we just don't have that. Sometimes we just are burnt out on it. I just can't do it today, God. Seeing some of you nodding your heads makes me feel a lot better because I feel that way too. On those days, in those seasons, that's okay. Your ability to trust actually makes no difference in terms of all of those truths for your life and the life of your neighbor. Jesus actually tells us in this story that trust... Jesus being with us is not something that we do on our own. No one can come to me. That source is loving and tenacious and will continue to draw you close so that you will now in this life and the life to come experience that deep satisfaction that comes from knowing I am loved, I am enough. This too shall pass. God is with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as you are able, I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we sing our closing song, Good to Me.
can taste the sweetness of your mercy But I feel a thing of grief still in my chest Not sure I've known the one without the other But I will cling to the belief I know Out my hand and hopes you hold on, but time and time again find empty space. So I will keep them open though they're shaking. Call to mind the times I felt the grip of grace. You have been, you will be. You are so. friends, as you go out from here, may God bless you and keep you. May God shine a light upon you and be gracious to you. May you experience the presence of God within you always. And may that give you deep peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>